Welcome to the show, my friends and teammates. If you're joining us for the first time, we're so grateful to have you here with us today. We refer to ourselves as Team Journey because we're not alone. We're a part of our team and we're all here to share the cancer journey together. So let's get started. I'm so excited to introduce our guest today, my wife, Suzanne Foster. Suzanne, are you ready to share the journey? Yes, I am. Hello. All right. Suzanne was the primary caregiver for me, her husband, when I was dealing with my second journey with Hodgkin lymphoma cancer. Fortunately, I survived and we are very happy about our good health and sharing our lives together. Suzanne lives in Golden, Colorado and enjoys being a mom to our wonderful daughter, Jessie. Keeping physically fit, riding her horse named Cowboy, and spending her time with her mom and her sister who live nearby. She currently works as a paralegal at Jefferson County, and hopefully we can all learn a great deal from what she has to share with us today. Please join me in welcoming Suzanne Foster to the show. Welcome to the show, my dear. Thank you. All right. Well, I've given a brief introduction of you, Suzanne, but before we get into talking about your cancer caregiver journey, please take a moment and tell us a little bit more about yourself, like where you're from and what your life was like prior to becoming a cancer care caregiver for me. Well, I'm one of the few Colorado natives left, but I was I was obviously born here, lived in New Mexico for six years and moved back here and attended junior high and high school in Colorado. And from there on, I, I have done a lot of different things with my life. Met Jim in 1998 and we married and from there on, I've been a mom and I've worked a full-time job and do a lot of things outside and just have an active life. Okay, well, I can vouch for that. <laughs> um, what happened in your husband's life, my life, uh, that caused me to think that something was physically wrong with me again after having cancer uh, five years prior and being in remission, what what was it that happened that caused us to think that something was wrong with me at that point? Well, what happened in 19, I remember meeting you in 1998 and you were well on your way of, of being cured and, and doing well. We uh, got married in 1999. I became pregnant in January of 2002 and you were short five years remission and unfortunately I want to say March my time frames are kind of all kind of all meshed together you you felt a lump in your neck again and I know that you always check your you're always very conscientious about checking your your lymph nodes and and kind of know where to look for those things so I remember thinking that was March um, I was pregnant so we were short I don't know how many weeks of your five-year remission I remember thinking oh my goodness this is it was pretty scary well it was scary and that uh, lump in my neck uh, led to a, a biopsy uh, which led to a, a which came back positive and then they did a, a PET scan and ultimately I was diagnosed once again uh, with Hodgkin lymphoma after just shy of five years remission and that was tough for us I remember that uh, you being pregnant a lot going through my mind but um, what was your initial reaction to that and what were your emotions and feelings uh, when you got that news I actually vividly remember the day that this happened. I was at work and I was thinking to myself, there's no way that this could be coming back. It was just a weird lump and and I got a phone call at my desk and you told me it had come back. And I, there was a lot of things that ran through my mind. I, I thought, oh my goodness, it's, it, it's amazing. 
what you're thinking. Am I going to be a single mother? How can you? How can I think that way? I've got to be optimistic. What are, you know? What's the the worst case scenarios? I think run through your mind initially, and then you have to somehow work through it and pull the positive out and think about how you're going to get through it. I, I, I just I pretty much was in shock for a while and and it just it took a while to to digest the news that i had heard well i know we both had a lot to digest uh that night and the days that followed um at what point in this whole process did you realize that you were about to become my personal caregiver uh and you know what was that conversation like and what did you think that was going to entail well my recollect was that we went we we had um meetings to go to classes to go to and they talked about food prep and certain things that you'd have to do for someone who was going through a stem cell transplant and i don't think it really hit me as to what my caregiver capacity would be until the visiting nurse came over one day after work and she put down a lot of instructions that completely uh, baffled and bewildered me about how much work it was going to be and I remember thinking at one point I'm just going to ask the doctors if they can just put him in the hospital through this whole thing. Oh, it was you. very, <laughs> it was very involved. And however, um, I, 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 I managed it and it, it worked out. So at first it's overwhelming and you think there's just no way, but, but you can do it with the help of, you know, family and friends and the initial hands-on caregiving I did by myself and it was a it was definitely an experience. Well, and you did a great job. Thank you very much for that. I owe a lot of my life to you for that. Um, let me ask you this. Had you ever been a caregiver for someone else who had cancer or a major illness and um, if so, what was that like? No, I really had not. And, and I guess I, I consider that fortunate. We've had, a, we've been, you know, lucky that the family that I come from, everybody's been healthy and, you know, nobody was in a situation that I had to be their caregiver. So it was definitely an experience. So I have that knowledge now um, and compassion to understand when someone's sick um, that there's there's a lot involved and and you get through it you definitely do well we were fortunate that uh, that we got through it uh, we were also fortunate that we lived in the same town where I was getting treatments even though it was about uh, depending on rush hour and traffic it was 20 minutes or 25 minutes uh, back and forth to the hospital and the clinic and so forth um, a lot of people live in a different town or have to relocate and so forth but um, <clears throat> it's a huge amount of work uh, helping a patient get to and from appointments in my case I was I became after a little while of treatments too ill to drive myself to and from appointments uh, and you were a big part of helping me with that uh, what was that like I think a big part of that is being very very organized which is hard to do because your mind is is going in every different direction but if you can keep a strategic plan as to to what treatments and, and you have given the patient and how they've they've reacted and the questions you have for the doctor and just making it to the appointments and getting home and just feeling like you can get some rest after that's done that's a huge huge thing I think that one one thing people need to really you know understand is you the medical field has definitely um, put a lot on family members and 
that's of course to avoid you know extra insurance and such and you know you kind of become a responsible one to make sure everything gets done and um you do it because you love them and you do it because you want them to to get well well sure and uh being a caregiver is a very vital role to a cancer patient's success um i'm very grateful that that you were my primary caregiver the second time and my parents were the first time and I know there are people out there that don't have someone and I just feel for them that um, it's such a vital role and I would suggest anyone don't be afraid to ask someone your uh, friend a co-worker a family member someone say I need help you know I really need help with someone to help keep me organized uh, kind of like a personal personal assistant or a personal manager because there is so much information and so much work that that goes into nothing else than just driving to and from appointments when you're stressed out and and that sort of thing um, one thing I'd like to ask you is did you have any family members or friends uh, close by other than the patient obviously me uh, that were able to help you uh, in the caregiver role yes I did and it's amazing how many people actually stand up and want to help um, I I remember back when we were going through the food preparation classes we had my dad my stepmother their friends people were just showing up to to find out what they needed to do um, to help us with meals to come to find out that I've found out that during his process with his stem cell transplant he wasn't hungry so all that you know extra prep and worrying about the food prep really didn't matter that much um, although someone else may be different during that type of treatment um, my mother-in-law was over always bringing something over for me um, it was kind of it turned out that we were in a situation to where I slept most of the time when I had a break being pregnant and Jim slept 99% of the time so having people come over and people come by wasn't something we really wanted as far as visitors in the home but w there were a lot of phone calls um, you know just keeping in touch that way we didn't have all of the technology I know it sounds back then makes me old but it just there's a lot more things on social media to keep in touch and get updates on people but people people come forward and I think for people that don't feel like they have any support there are a lot of support groups out there and and seek it because you don't want to be alone at all well we were very fortunate to have family and friends that, that wanted to help and did help uh, let's break it down here for the listeners here tell us a few major tasks on any given day that you had to deal with I think the biggest task was making sure you got your medication on time um, there was a point in time to where you had a port put in you and I remember I had to get up at four o'clock in the morning and put the medication I'm yeah you know, it's been a while I'm trying to do a re remember exactly what all went in there but I would have to put the medication in the port and I would have to get back up and then take it out you would have the IV bags hanging and I did that for several days um, I just keeping the whole thought process um, organized as to what needs to happen and not mess up I mean it's pretty huge if you mess up so I just remember writing things down keeping a calendar um, I only took two weeks off of work so that was kind of limited um, it, it just like I said being organized is huge and it's you're tired you're stressed so writing things down is huge it's 
you know, and if you need someone to give you a reminder call or whatever it may be, because you're dealing with somebody who doesn't know what's going on and what they need, it's, it's kind of, you have a huge, huge thing at your hands to take care of. Well, let me just well, let me just say I'm so grateful. I mean, and for those of you out there listening, I just want to reiterate, Suzanne was pregnant at the time. I mean, the timing of this was at the time feel just like terrible and, and impossible. I mean, she was pregnant. Here she was getting up at midnight to give me an IV again at 4 a.m. and again at 8 a.m. before she left for work. It was just, it was absolutely insane is what it was. And, and I am so grateful for you. Honey, he remembers for, for, better than I do. That's kind of scary. For doing, <laughs> but you're still here. <laughs> well, you kept waking me up in the middle of the night, but uh, <laughs> oh, but gosh. it was it was a <clears throat> it was a rough road, and, and we got through it. Um, how did you? I mean, just uh, you know, what did you do to kind of? Uh, plan like you know like uh, your weekly schedule and stuff like that I mean how did how did you keep organized I know you're a very detail oriented person but how did you keep organized through all of this and know what times to give me those uh, IV infusions and what time to give me my my pills and what time to do all of that how you know what how did you do that well, I, I just used the old-fashioned method of writing stuff down, and the visiting nurse had given me a chart as to what you needed to have and when you needed to have it, and I can't remember if they had Xboxes on there or what, but there was a it was all tangible, piece of paper and a pen, basically at that time. So a real written uh, checklist type format mm -hmm. and so right. forth. Right, right. What would you say was one of your lowest points during the whole cancer journey that we, we shared together? I think the lowest point was when I took the time off work and I was doing the ports and I was exhausted. I just remember getting no sleep and I, I'm thinking, how am I, how are we going to make it through this? And, and in the meantime, you're trying to prepare for a baby and, and get the bills paid and and it just there there is a point in time to where you feel hopeless but then there's always you know that that glimmer of hope and a lot of that comes from the medical staff that you meet with like we went to the cancer center and they would they were upbeat and it was a different environment as far as you know getting um, a positive reinforcement there as to when you come home and you reprocess things. It's just people outside, people, your friends, your family, they bring you back to reality because you don't just give up. That's just not, that's just not a good option. Well, I'll tell you what, when we got married and we took our vows and, and uh, Pastor Ed said, uh, in sickness and in health, um, that really came true in our life and I am grateful for that. Um, so thank you. What would you say was one of your favorite um, favorite memories about your caregiver journey? I think my favorite memory about the whole thing is watching you get better, knowing we had a child on the way who has turned out to be a very healthy, healthy child, and um, just always looking to the future and, and where we were going. Um, as far as being the caregiver, I think that I, um, I just knowing it could get you through to the end and, and seeing you get better. I mean, it wasn't like things were getting worse, you know? I mean, there were so many, so many days to where you, you looked better, you felt better and knowing there there is an insight with this this journey as you call it um people people do get well uh it's amazing it's amazing that that 
we've got this technology that can get people to the end. And, and, and attitude, your attitude was so positive. Um, I have to say, you kept this positive attitude that just kept going and going. Your your business was busy at the time, and your partner was like keeping it together and showing up and having you sign on documents. And I mean, we we still had a lot of great things going on. Well, uh, what you said there about being positive—I mean, it's very hard when you're a, a patient, and then it's. I did try to always stay positive, and we know that not everyone has uh, a successful positive outcome, but it definitely uh, it was a, a. It was something that helped me through my journey and I couldn't imagine going through it in a different way regardless of the outcome um, you know I, just, I tried to be positive and having a support person a caregiver like you uh, made it easier to remain positive so I'm very grateful for that let me ask you about this um, I certainly know how I felt emotionally and in in my own way uh when my doctor told me that the scans had came back and that my cancer was once again in remission uh, but let me ask you this as as a caregiver as as my wife what was your reaction uh when you got the news i mean i know you were there with me but what was your reaction when you got that news that my cancer was once again in remission well, I kind of felt like this was such a an incredible kind of treatment that you went through, um, a stem cell transplant. I felt like this is going to keep you well for for ever throughout your life. I mean, it's an amazing thing. I didn't. I didn't. It, it wasn't like what you went through before. I didn't know him the first time, you the first time. You went through the treatment where you had the chemotherapy. And this time it was it was something that just seemed so, more, so much more, um, I guess, a treatment that could be a cure. Uh, I... I I've, I, I felt confident that you would stay well. Well, knock on wood, <laughs> 15 years later here, and here we are, I'm so grateful every day. Let me ask you this, uh, was there something you and I had been looking forward to uh, doing when we got that news, kind of a, a way to, to celebrate or um, just acknowledge our, our happiness and, and gratefulness at that point? Well, at that time, Jessie was not born yet. That's our daughter. She's 16 now. Um, we just went away. We, we, we would go away to either our land in Wyoming. Um, it's a nice little peaceful getaway. Or, and we went to Estes Park, and we just got away. Got away to get our mind off of everything. Well, I remember the first uh, night that we went to Estes Park and we had our former dog, Mr. Bojangles, with us. And we went and we stayed in the, a little cabin there um, right on the, on the river. And oh. it was just so nice just being away and feeling like we were in a different place altogether. It was such a wonderful experience, and uh, and uh, I remember that well too. It was it was just a it was a nice getaway to just reflect on good health and and being grateful that the journey was one step closer to to being behind us. Yeah, I would strongly suggest that people do things to get their mind off the situation you know just go if you can go for a good walk um, get out of the house get some air just keep the momentum of of getting well better going on going on 
Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Um, what have you been doing with your life since uh, being a caregiver? Well, I've been, we have been raising our daughter and just moving forward with life. I mean, working just the day-to-day -day routine that most people live. We've been very fortunate to that uh, with Jesse being healthy and she's almost 16 now. She's 15 and it is a lot of fun. You're, <laughs> you're now not just a caregiver for me, but you're in a way a caregiver for our family and you do such a great job of keeping Jesse and I organized and helping around the house so in a, in a way you've kind of continued the role as a caregiver a little bit and we probably need to pitch in and help out a little more than we do but um, I just can't say enough for for what a great mom and and wife and caregiver that you are um, let me ask you this what are your hopes and dreams for the future I think probably just to hopefully maintain the wellness that we are experiencing now health wise um, I don't need a lot in life I just like simplicity and want to be able to enjoy what everybody else does go on trips here and there and get through the teenage years it's a main goal see my daughter off to college and and, and make sure she has a great life and that we can can in the future here retire and just be comfortable and not stressed. Well, I wanna bring up one thing that I know about you that our audience doesn't, but Suzanne growing up uh, got her first horse when she was in elementary school and she loved horses and worked at a horse racetrack in high school and whatnot and that had been a dream of ours after we met to somehow get a horse uh, for Suzanne and and we we're very fortunate to get some property in Wyoming where we could have a horse but uh, tell us about your horse uh, what his name is and what you enjoy doing with that part of your life we have a horse named cowboy and I do enjoy riding him and and I'm an outdoorsy person and and I just he's getting up there in age he's gonna be I guess 25 I just found out and so I'll probably get another one after that but um, yeah just enjoy doing little uh, rodeos here and there and that's kind of just a, a, a off the side hobby well it sure makes me happy to know that someone that contributed so much effort and care and love in their life to help me that that you get to enjoy that with your horse and that's just very <clears throat> very fulfilling for me uh, let me ask you this um, now that my cancer has been in remission and in effect our cancer journey has been in remission for 15 years now is there something that you like to do or why don't you share what we like to do kind of uh, to celebrate certain milestones I, as far as celebrating milestones, we like to take trips. Um, we like to go to Wyoming to our land there. That's always a nice break, and we love to go out to eat. We do that a lot. <laughs> well, we have, we do go out to eat a little too much, probably, and uh, it is kind of nice every year with my remission date being in August and kind of coincides there with my birthday and and we we enjoy our time getting away uh, usually over over my birthday weekend there so I'm grateful for that um, what words of wisdom would you give to other caregivers who's um, who are caring for a loved one a friend a family member a spouse um, that's been diagnosed with cancer going through their cancer journey what words of wisdom would you give to them I would say in the beginning it's just gonna be surreal when you find out this is the road you're going down try 
to take a step back, breathe, and and realize that it's at first it's not as bad as it it appears. And people do make it through this, and all you can do is be a great support system and really, really think the best and keep keep thinking the best, don't think the worst. And you will be amazed at, at how you can get through this. And one thing I think that as a caregiver, you have a tendency to put things behind, and I think patients do too, and life moves forward and, and you will go forward and and there's always great things ahead. Well, those are wonderful words of advice for sure. Um, now we kind of moving forward here to the what I call the lightning round and it's a series of a few questions here and and your uh, brief responses to them so the first question is what was the scariest moment that you experienced during the cancer journey I would say the scariest moment was knowing I was pregnant and my husband had cancer it's probably it Wow yeah, that that is heavy. Um, how did you overcome that fear? Trying to um, be futuristic and thinking about how my daughter was coming, or at the time, I guess we didn't know what if it was a boy or a girl, but just trying to prepare my life for having a child, um, and hopefully with her with the father. And I just overcame it by moving forward because that's all you can really do. Give us an example of a small accomplishment that you achieved during your cancer caregiver journey and how that made you feel. Well, I accomplished still working full time, except for the two weeks that I took off. Um, I feel like I accomplished getting very prepared to be a mother which was a huge accomplishment. And I accomplished getting you through your illness um, or assisting you with it. What was the best piece of advice you ever received and how did that help you through your cancer caregiver journey? I think, I wouldn't even call it advice. I would just say the words that I kept hearing from everyone is, Suze, we're here for you. Jim, we're here for you. And that's all you really need to hear from people. Yeah, and we're just very grateful for for those people that stepped up to the plate. It, it was amazing, the outpouring yeah, of love really and, was. and caring that, that people uh, shared with us. Let me ask you this. What, uh, what was a resource that you found helpful to you as a caregiver that you might uh, recommend to our audience, something that you used or some, some things that you used uh, to help you uh, be a good caregiver and help uh, the, the patient, being me, um, through a successful journey? Well, I can say that I, there are new resources out there that I did not have. Um, and when we talk about organizing and we talk about writing stuff down, I do know that now they have this out, which is called the CAN plan. And it's basically put together by a young woman that took care of her mother who had cancer. And it's a great resource to, to it's, it tracks what is going on with the patient it can help you as well um, there's also a book out that is really great for the patients but it's also good for a caretaker the autologous stem cell transplant book very helpful for people that are going undergoing a stem cell transplant that's a great resource and then I would also recommend the eating well through cancer cookbook um, yeah. simple recipes for patients and for families those are great resources well and as you quickly found out um, being kind of head chef during that time and, and most of the time during our marriage but I must say and thank you for that but 
uh, being a cancer patient, your appetite has huge swings in what you might have an appetite for and how things taste and so forth. And having a cookbook that is designed for cancer patients whose taste buds may be altered uh, during treatments and so forth. And the short window of time that you have to prepare something that might be both uh, appetizing and uh, nutritious um, is a, a big part of meal preparation. And um, so yeah, that's those are some great resources there and being able to keep organized. I know the can plan organizer, I wish I would have had one of those uh, during both of my cancer journeys because not only does it help you as a patient keep organized um, and also your caregiver and other people keep organized regarding appointments and that sort of thing, but it also has a lot of motivational and inspirational content in the planner that can help you day by day stay positive and be optimistic uh, about the future and, and about the outcome. So, so those are some great resources. Uh, one thing I would like to ask you is, uh, obviously we made it through uh, the cancer journey. Uh, you successfully gave birth to our daughter, Jessie, and she's healthy. And I've been in remission now for, for 15 years. But if you had it to do all over again and you knew that you were gonna achieve and I was gonna achieve the same uh, positive outcome and Jesse was gonna achieve the same positive outcome, what would you have done differently if you had it to do all over again? I would say that um, I would try to maybe have more patience through the whole process. Um, I feel like there was a point in time to where I, you just feel impatient. You want it to go quicker. You want more answers from the doctors. You want, you know, I just think I would have tried to, I don't know, take some steps back and, and I think that you even get to a point sometimes where you lose your patience with the patient, trust me. And I think that you you actually regret Probably that my fault. somewhat. Um, I would try to have more patience and I guess just kind of put it in perspective that this too shall pass because it really does. Um, it moves forward and it it's, I guess if I look back now that I think about it, I, I, I guess the two P's, patience and, and positive are the most important thing when you're being a caretaker. And as we talked about before, trying to oh, ask for help if you need it. Just there are so many people out there that will help even he said, if you feel like you have nobody, there's somebody out there that will help. Uh, support groups, um, there's just all, and, and medical insurance coverage, there's the GoFundMe pages, there's all kinds of things out there that can help you, help you get through, but you can't not ask for help because it will drain you. And um, just know that, that people are there, they're there for you. Well, one thing I have to say is you were there for me and my hope and wish for every patient out there listening is that you have someone like a Suzanne that can be your caregiver and it, it may be more than one person. It may be two or three or four um, people, but it's very hard to ask someone to help you and you feel like they may not understand and why are you putting so much burden on them and so forth, but it truly is one of the most important parts of the cancer journey. And in my case, 
you know, a, a successful uh, outcome of being in remission now for the second time. I couldn't have done it without Suzanne and the first time without my parents uh, being there t to take care of all the details. There, there's so much that goes on with insurance companies and appointments and medications and cooking and chores around the home and cleaning and it's it's endless the workload that a caregiver undertakes and being able as a caregiver to delegate to others uh, in a way that other people who want to help and offer help can help in an organized way. So Suzanne was really wonderful at managing all of that and doing all of that while she was pregnant. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Um, and I'm so grateful uh, for you, Suzanne, and, and just so thankful for you. It's, it's, it's unbelievable what you did. And hopefully people listening can take away something from those words of wisdom that you shared with us here today. I mean, you've, you've laid out so many awesome resources and tools and tips uh, that you used through our journey. And I'm just so hopeful that other people can, can gain some insight uh, in their own cancer caregiver journey uh, as a caregiver or a patient uh, realizing the need for a caregiver it's, it's kind of like being um, someone that has a, a huge responsibility and having a, a personal assistant whether it's an office assistant or an assistant for uh, someone who's um, a rock star or something i mean having someone there that can do all the behind the scenes work is, is so vital and suzanne was definitely uh rock star status when it came to that um but before we wrap it up today uh i just want to pass on that all of the resources that suzanne talked about uh today uh can be found at our show notes uh, at the bottom of, th of this podcast or over at cancerinterviews.com um, on the show notes page uh, for this episode. And there'll be links to those resources like the can plan and, and the cookbook and, and that sort of thing. And so I want to invite you to check that out. And Suzanne, before we sign off here today, uh, could you please leave our listeners with one or two final pieces of advice? Then uh, let us know if there's a way to, to follow you online, maybe your Facebook handle or something like that, and then we'll say goodbye. I think one piece of advice that I have would be to encourage the patient that they're going to get better because I know that there are some low points to where they feel so physically run down and crummy and you have to be that encouragement as a caretaker and just just keep keep doing that as, as frustrating as it can be at times because um, it does pay off and they need to hear that they need to hear it and just remember that you're kind of their guidance as far as getting to the very end of this journey and and getting better and moving on and enjoying life from here on out. And do, do you uh, have a Facebook handle or something? Or are you just Suzanne Foster Golden? Or if well, I don't know if it's out. a handle. I'm, I'm <laughs> on Facebook. I'm not on there a lot, but I'm under, yeah, Suzanne Foster Golden. Well, Suzanne, thank you so much for your time, your expertise, and your knowledge. Team Journey salutes you, and we'll see you on down the road. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And to all of you out there listening, please know that you're not alone. You're a part of our team. We're all in this together, and together everyone achieves more. Until next time, take care, and we'll see you on down the road. Thanks for joining us today. For more information, please visit us online at cancerinterviews.com. We appreciate you tuning in, and we'll see you back here again next time on the Cancer Interviews Podcast.